Hey, it's Frank. August 4th. Whoa, the summer's cruising on by. August 4th is a Friday. Welcome to the weekend. Hope you had a great week. Checking in on some hot topics for the week. Hard not to focus on yesterday's indictment of President Trump yet again. Excuse me, former President Trump. By the way, I, sh I don't believe ex-officials, ex-elected officials should be called by their former title. When you are no longer president, I don't have to call you president. When you are no longer senator, I don't have to call you senator. When you are lo no longer governor, I don't have to call you governor. Enough of that silliness. Apparently, Donald Trump was a little annoyed that he was called by his name in court yesterday, not by President Trump. Trump was arraigned on an indictment charging him with conspiracy to fraud the United States, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, obstruction, and conspiracy against the right to vote and to have one's vote counted. 45-page indictment for Mr. Jack Smith, the nemesis to Donald Trump. Lots of excitement on the left, obviously. Democrats have been after Donald Trump for a long time now. They think they may have him this time. Stipulating I'm not a lawyer, although I follow closely legal proceedings, I can understand the jargon and you know read a report and read an indictment and make some assessments. I think Democrats might be getting ahead of themselves again here. Now, the judge in this case, Judge Tanya Chutkin, I believe is the pronunciation, and, and President Obama appointee, and the judge who's been doling out the most harsh sentences for the January 6th rioters, is the judge. That's something. She's not a fan of Trump. She's taken out these January 6th rioters. She believes that what happened on January 6th was an affront to democracy, of course, as most do. Pretty harsh, apparently, in doling out sentences related to this. Now, beyond that judge, the merits of this case seem to be weak. I heard a phrase, opposition research, to describe this 45-page indictment rather than a legal indictment that can actually has teeth. So there may be some disappointment in the end in terms of how this turns out based on the charges. Speculation at this point, of course. I saw a great response to the indictment by David Stockman from the Reagan administration, 1980s, director of the, of the Office of Management and Budget. Had a story career in Washington, D.C. The fiscal hawk sits on the right side of the political spectrum, has been complaining about what's going on in Washington, D.C. for 40 years. He's still writing and researching. I think he's 76 now. He wrote a really interesting piece overnight to describe what was happening. And he's, he was going out to talk about how it has nothing to do with justice or the rule of law or the protection of democracy and everything to do with triggering a trial clock in the D.C. District Court that results in a guaranteed guilty verdict before the November 5th, 2024 election. I've talked about this many a few times already on the podcast. And if that were to succeed, this sets a very dangerous precedent such that we might consider no incumbent party will ever again go into presidential election without mobilizing the machinery of the Department of Justice. But when you think about safeguarding the republic from Donald Trump's, and this is these are the words of David Stockman, ego maniacal incompetence, bileless rants, uninformed laziness, flagrant delusions, and principle free quest for power and glory is the job of voters. That is to say that this 45 page indictment, not only is it insufficient, but it's not the correct process that voters should decide whether or not Donald Trump moves forward. And I just love those adjectives he used to describe Trump. Hard to argue against him, of course. So let me just read a little bit from what he had to say. Jack Smith has penned a potent opposition research paper, but it is utterly bogus as a criminal indictment. That's because it embodies exactly the age-old ploy used by all zealous prosecutors when they don't have hard evidence of the specific crime. To wit, they cobble together a spurious conspiracy narrative from a string of wholly legal and or prosaic actions and events involving the defendant, and then backdate them with mens rea, guilty intent, and the assertion that everything contained in the resulting made-for-TV narrative was done knowingly. He went on to say, the plain fact is that Smith's 45 pages of purported nefarious doings do not embody a criminal conspiracy at all. What the indictment actually describes is Trump world at work in all of its pandemonium, bickering, incompetence, and shoot-from-the-hip recklessness. The self-evident reason that Trump pursued the election fraud canard right up until the wee hours of January 7th, when the electors finally certified Biden's victory, is that the man is a megalomaniacal brute who just won't take no for an answer. Love that. 
So there was no conspiracy, no threat to democracy. There was just the bitter end, obstinance, and bombast of a defeated old bully and his drunken companion, Rudy Giuliani, who had once capriciously welded the badge and gun that had soon come down on his head, too. And he concluded, still expressing disagreement with and contradicting the advice of 95% of your advisors in a public venue like social media is not a crime and not proof of a lie. Anyway, Stockman's take on the Trump indictment. A good read, by the way, David Stockman. Very objective guy. Relies on the data. All right. The other hot topic I had today was how do conspiracy theories start? How do conspiracy theories start? We have a really interesting example developing right in front of us. In a very, it's in a slow moving way. So pretty easy to get a, a hold on. And it's not a big major issue, but this is how it happens. So we know it's been about 11 days since Tafari Campbell drowned in a pond bordering the former President Obama's estate in Martha's Vineyard. And there's already efforts to seemingly cover up whatever really happened. And what, we, what I mean by that is the state police, the Martha's Vineyard police authorities involved in this investigation are doing things differently than they would normally be done in such a case. And more importantly, withholding information that would normally be revealed. And it's interesting to see how these little changes in how things are done are already creating cons a conspiracy theory for this, this case, this poor guy's death. Massachusetts State Police are covering up information about the drowning of Barack Obama's personal chef. They've labeled this incident an accident, but continuing to withhold information under the guise of an ongoing investigation. We hear that all the time from law enforcement officials or lawyers. Or It's an easy way to deflect or not share information. Authorities are rejecting requests for even basic facts, including the identity of the sole witness and the 911 caller. Again, stuff that would be normally revealed without question on public records. The state is citing public records law exemption that allows police to withhold any information that could jeopardize an active investigation. Again, different. The burden is on law enforcement to show how their investigation may be jeopardized by releasing certain information, said Justin Silverman executive director of the New England First Amendment Coalition. And they're not doing that right now. This really flies in the face of public records law. So again, just not doing things the way they're normally done is raising eyebrows. Antennas are going up. What is going on? Why are they not following the normal procedure? Moreover, state, of, state police officials are making sure that other state agencies involved in the investigation have the same response as theirs, that they follow their lead. Apparently, sources who participated in the initial multi-jurisdictional effort say that the state police have even armed departments with rejection letters to send to the media. And the media, of course, has been bombarding agencies with questions. Another public safety officer involved in, in the initial investigation said that state police sent out those templates for us, too. And he went on to say, this, this safety officer, it's driving me absolutely nuts because it's making it seem like there's something going on when there's not. As far as I know, some poor guy went out on a paddleboard and he wasn't a great swimmer and he drowned. He says, I know the optics of this look like it could be a lot more than that. I see what makes this story. I know this has a recipe for conspiracy. And he's got, you know, arms up, shoulders up, shrugging. What the hell? But from what I've seen, there's no drama to this, he says. If you guys just had everything and you see there's really nothing to, to this to move on, instead... You're left with what appears to be a mystery. Conspiracy theories are already developing. There's Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, videos going around asserting that Campbell was writing a tell-all book on the Obamas when he was found with head trauma in three to four feet of water on the Obama estate. There are claims that nobody called 911 for hours until Campbell washed up on shore and that Obama's own personal coroner was flown from Washington, D.C. to perform the autopsy. This source I was just re referencing to a, a few minutes ago, again, wondering why this lack of information is in, in obviously fueling conspiracy thoughts. He went on to say, we're supposed to be transparent. This total drama to this, not giving out names, it's kind of horseshit. It's just dragging this out unnecessarily. What are we at? 10, 11 days now? It's a drowning. It's unfortunate. In a coastal community, we've had a number of these over the years. Anyway, 
the police are not revealing all the information they normally reveal. We've seen reports that the 45 year old was out with another paddleboarder who tried to save him. The person then summoned help from someone who called 911. But authorities are even refusing to identify who this person was, who the 911 caller is. And there's speculation that there might be involved in Obama's Secret Service detail. Meanwhile, Martha's Vineyard police even left the reason for the emergency call blank in official logs from the night of the incident. The reason for every other call that night is given. They wouldn't even release the gender of the witness. And so here is a really interesting example of how conspiracy theories start by public officials doing things very differently than they would normally do them. And obviously, this surrounds a very important person in a very important community. And so there's a little example of how that develops conspiracy theories, right? And they're going to keep digging. And the more they, they are, the greater the roadblocks, the greater the barriers to finding out the information, the greater will be the conspiracy theory thoughts. All right. So I have for you there. Let's check in on economy in the markets for the week. Looking back on this past Tuesday, we had June construction spending up 0.5%, a little worse than expected, looking for up 06 and weaker than May of 1.1%. Not bad. Construction is a volatile series. Also on Tuesday, we had the ISM Manufacturing Index, the health of the manufacturing sector in the U.S., 46.4 versus 46.8 in expected versus 46 in June. This was a July number. A little weaker, below 50, continues to mean contraction. Wednesday, as always, at 7 a.m. Wednesday, we have the MBA mortgage applications for the weekend in July 27th, minus 3%. 30-year mortgage, 6.93%. That's ticked up from 6.87%. And also on Wednesday, we had the July ADP employment report, 324,000 new jobs created in the month of July. Holy cow, God bless America. Happy days. What a labor market. Expecting 189,000. And that's against the June number 455. Holy cow, what a number. But the strong labor data will keep the Hawks' attention. Thursday, as always, at 8.30, initial unemployment claims for the weekend in July 28th. How many of our fellow Americans lost their jobs, had to file for unemployment insurance? 227,000, as expected, versus 221,000 the prior week. Still phenomenal numbers. Also on Thursday, we had second quarter non-farm productivity up 3.7%. Fantastic number. Versus 2% expected, versus minus 1.2% in the first quarter. Also Thursday, we had June factory orders up 2.3%, versus 2.2% expected, versus 0.4% in May. Another good number. ISN non-manufacturing index also out on Thursday, 57 versus 57.2 versus 59.2 in June. That was a July number I just referenced. And the Fed balance sheet shrunk to $8.207 trillion from $8.243 trillion. And just as I'm recording my show today, we have the employment situation report being released for the month of July, the health of the U.S. labor market. Headline number is a non-farm payroll number, 187,000. New jobs created on a net basis in the month of July, lower than expected, 200,000, and about as it was in June of 185,000. Not bad, way below the ADP number, so a little dichotomous there. We also had average hourly earnings up 0.4%. It's a touch high, looking for 0.3, same as 0.4 in June. Average weekly hours, 34.3, ticked down one-tenth of 1% 1 there, expecting 34.4. We have the... Unemployment rate U3, the narrow measure of unemployment, 3.5%, a little better than 3.6 expected, better than 3.6 in June. Then we have our broadest measure of unemployment, the U6 rate, 6.7%, a little lower than expected, 6.8, and lower than June of 6.9. So a little bit of mixed bag. Unemployment numbers indicate strong labor markets. Non-farm payrolls a little weak. Average hourly earnings a little bit inflationary. And so this week we have more, more cause to think about the Fed's next move as being a hike. And again, I don't think they're going to do that in the next meeting or two or three. But if this data keeps up, their next move will be a hike rather than a cut or to continue to pause for extended periods of time. Remember, sell rallies in equities, buy dips in the dollar, buy dips in bonds. All right, that's all I have for you. Always try to buy American.